Michael asked me here um, to give a little bit of an introduction to what's called the extended mind thesis. So I'm going to spend the next um, 15 minutes um, just kind of walking you guys through that view. So um, for those of you who don't know or haven't heard of it, this is a view that's become quite popular in philosophy of cognitive science over the last 20 years or so. And basically the view asks, where does the mind stop and the rest of the world begin? Now, if you were to um, sort of ask the person next to you, most of us are probably in the room alone right now, but <laughs> if you were to uh, walk on the bus or walk into somebody on the street and just ask a random person, you know, where's your mind? Um, if I were to ask most of you as audience members, I think a lot of us would probably point somewhere around here. And that's this, this sort of standard wisdom, right? Is that the mind just is the brain, or at least it stands in some very special relationship to the brain. Um, and this view, you know, uh, the extended mind thesis says that's true, but there's the, the view claims that there's a lot more to the mind than just the brain. And in fact, the mind can exist in places uh, outside of the brain, at least partly. So that's the view, which maybe sounds a bit radical, I don't know, but, um, or maybe you're very comfortable with it, but that's the view that I'm gonna kind of walk you through. So what's the argument for a view like that? And what, what grounds do we have to maintain a view like that? Um, so a, another kind of way of approaching this view is to, to think about the question, what effect is technology having on our cognitive capacities? And this is a question actually that has a long history in philosophy. So for thousands of years, actually, philosophers have debated about the effects that technology is having on cognition. Um, and so you can look as early as um, Socrates um, in some of Plato's dialogues, um, like the Phaedrus in particular, uh, the character Socrates argues against and he strongly resists the current technology at that time, precisely because he argues that it will have a diminishing effect on our cognition. So the, the major technological advancement at that time was a switch from the oral tradition to, to literacy. So people were starting to write words down on paper and Socrates thought that's not a good idea. That's gonna make us all very forgetful. And it could even have a negative impact on our social capacities is what Socrates thought. So he really resisted that and it started this early debate about whether or not technology could have this diminishing effect or maybe it could do the opposite and it could have an, an enhancing effect. And what the extended mind thesis says is that it, it has this an enhancing effect rather than a diminishing effect or at least for the most part. So um, without further ado, I'll walk you through this argument a little bit, but maybe a, a bit of history on the view. So. Um, this paper came out in 1998 called The Extended Mind Thesis, and it was written by two philosophers, uh, philosopher David Chalmers, who's famous for his work on consciousness, maybe Isaiah will talk about him a bit, and the other author was uh, philosopher Andy Clark, um, who's famous precisely for his work on and this type of stuff, on this view. Um, and in that, that paper in 1998, it made quite a splash, so it became one of the most cited papers in philosophy of cognitive science in the last 20 years. So it really started a whole movement of people rethinking what the mind was. And the way that Clark and Chalmers argued um, for the extended mind thesis was to begin with a premise which was meant to be very comfortable to their audience at the time. So the sort of standard philosopher of cognitive science. So for those of you who don't know, um, one of the foundational commitments of cognitive science as a science is to something like the computational theory of mind. And the computational theory of mind essentially says that thinking is a process of symbol manipulation that is typically carried out by uh, neurons in the brain or neural processes in the brain. Um, and so the extended mind thesis says, as a first premise, you know, that's true. Let's say that something like our best science of the mind, the, the commitments that that science has, let's say those commitments are true. So let's say computationalism is true. Um, but but let's leave open the possibility that it's not just neurons in the brain that can perform the kind of computations that underlie our mental processes. So what Clark and Chalmers um, argue for as a kind of second premise is the claim that we should treat computationally equivalent processes as being on a par, irrespective of whether they are internal or external to the skull. So irrespective of where they take place and irrespective of what they're made of. So it shouldn't matter um, that 
that neurons typically bring about our mental processes. Because what the computational theory of mind says is that it's the computations that matter. So whatever the substrate is that can pro perform those relevant computations, we, we shouldn't care what the substrate is as long as it can perform the relevant computations. And so, so Clark and Chalmers kind of follow that line of reasoning um, to its conclusions here. So the, um, just to reiterate, the parity principle is basically saying we, we should be, um, you know, if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, we should call it a duck. So if it looks like cognition and it's acting like cognition, we should call it cognition, irrespective of where it is and irrespective of what it's made of. And then um, their conclusion um, is going to be something like, well, the mind can extend beyond the brain. So how do they get there, <laughs> right? Um, so their second premise, they try to kind of give some content to that, to substantiate it with by way of a kind of thought experiment. So I'll just walk you through that. So um, the thought experiment goes, imagine two people. The first person is um, Inga. And Inga is meant to be just like you or I. So Inga, um, let's say, um, forms a desire to go to the museum to see this exciting exhibit that she's heard of. So um, Inga thinks to herself, well, I know where the museum is. I've been there before. I want to go there. So she thinks to herself, the museum's located on 53rd Street. And so she takes that information and she applies it into action and she heads in that direction. So this is a kind of standard story in uh, cognitive science, right? Um, we have a, a belief, we have a desire, and that leads to an action. And the thought is that that information that Inga had is, is somehow stored in her brain and that she's able to access that information and then put it into use to, to drive her behavior. Um, so that's just kind of a standard story. And then you're about, uh, about uh, asked to imagine a man named Otto, and Otto um, suffers from Alzheimer's disease. And as a result, he writes a lot of stuff down. So he carries a notebook and a pen, and he writes all this information down. Now we imagine that Otto uh, also wants to go to the, to the same exhibit. So what he does is he thinks to himself, well, I've been there before, and I wrote down the address of the museum in my notebook. So he goes and he looks up the address. And he says, oh, it's on 53rd Street. So then he accesses that information and he puts it into action and he heads into the direction of the museum. So um, what Clark and Chalmers argue is that uh, in the relevant respects, these two cases, the case of Otto and the case of Inga, are entirely analogous. So functionally speaking, the notebook plays the same role for Otto as um, Inga's brain plays for her in terms of uh, driving their cognition and um, getting them to where they want to go. And so as a result, uh, what Clark and Chalmers conclude using this example is that our, some of our tools, so for example, Otto's notebook, can be just as functionally essential to our cognition as the synapses firing in our heads. So they can be constitutive parts of our minds. And as you can imagine, um, this view was sort of very exciting back in 1998. Oh, wow. You know, notebooks can become part of our minds. <laughs> um, and then about 10 years later, we all had iPhones. And so um, Andy Clark and David Chalmers thought, oh, my gosh, what a perfect example of how our, our piece of our mind can be outside of our heads. These are so much smarter and so much more powerful than just a notebook. And they carry so much of your information that you used to carry in your brain. So if you think about, for example, all the phone numbers that you used to have to remember. So I'm old enough where I used to have to remember a lot of phone numbers in my head. <laughs> and I used to just walk around with this information. And now I totally don't do that. <laughs> all of that information is in my phone. And all I have to remember, thankfully, is my passcode. And I just have to get into the phone. So in, in, in a sense, it's really expanded the amount of memory capacity that we have. And it's freed up a lot of our internal space to do other things. And that it really is the view that the philosopher Andy Clark has been a big proponent of. So Andy Clark calls uh, us humans the offloading apes. So he says that um, we're the apes, unlike the other apes. We're the apes that put information into the world and we offload that sort of difficult and boring cognitive labor onto our tools and onto our environments. And that frees us up to do other things. And that's part of what makes us so unique as humans is that we can use tools to complete our cognitive goals. So, so that really is the extended mind thesis. And I haven't seen what the questions are popping up, but um, a lot of times people think, well, hold on. Now that's, that seems like a really messy view because 
it looks like everything you touch now, everything you use, every book you read is going to become a part of your mind. And so, you know, this idea, idea of what a mind is becomes really bloated. So this is the objection that's called cognitive bloat. Um, and so what Clark and Chalmers try to do is say, look, you, it's not every tool that you use, but it's certain tools that become really functionally integrated into your cognition. So the smartphone is a great example of that. And so is Otto's notebook because they're constants in your life. Um, so there's a constancy there. They tend to be highly accessible. So the information stored in them is easily accessible to the agent. So the way that Clark and Chalmers described Otto's case, for example, is that he carried that notebook with him everywhere he went. He was able to access the information in the notebook without any difficulty. And as a kind of third condition, um, we can call it reliability. So Otto um, rarely questioned the veracity of the information in his notebook. He didn't look at it and think, well, is the museum really on 53rd Street? No, he just endorsed it. He didn't question it just like Inga endorsed the information in her mind or that was stored in her brain. Um, and just like many of us do with the information in our phones, right? I mean, you don't question, is that really Michael's phone number? No, I trust my phone has the information that it hasn't been manipulated, that it's there just the way I put that information in there. And then I just use that to call Michael when I need to. So, so there's certain, certain conditions that Clark and Chalmers tried to give to demarcate what becomes part of the mind and what doesn't. It's a kind of rough and ready tool. So I think I'm almost at 15 minutes here. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll wrap up there. And I hope that gives you guys kind of a sense of what the extended mind thesis maintains. So the view in a sentence is that um, the mind can be more than just the brain and that some of our tools can become part of the constitutive machinery of our minds, just like the brain is part of the constitutive machinery, the physical basis of your mind. Um, but it's not just anything. It's got to be things that meet certain conditions. And that's where a lot of the philosophical debate consists these days. So 20 years later is what are those conditions? How do we make sense of what's a part of the mind and what isn't? Can we draw clear boundaries at all between where the mind stops and the rest of the world begins? So Hope asks, do you think the intention with which a note is made matters for the cognitive status of that external information? Good. That's interesting. So the intention with which a note is made matters for the cognitive status of that external information. Um, let's see here. I think, I guess, so there's a question. My own view is that I, I don't think that it does. I don't think that somebody has to, so for example, auto doesn't have to be storing that information with the goal that it will become a part of his mind um, for it to count as a part of his mind, if that's, if that's the question. And um, I think that, there might be some, so, so it depends what the intention is, I guess. Maybe the intention is that he, he might have to write it down with the intention that he's going to go back to it and use that in some way. So there might be some intention required there. Um, you'd have to maybe specify, um, you know, there's probably a bunch of intentions that don't matter. Maybe there's one or two that do. So we, you'd have to think a little bit about what those might be. Um, that's the only question I see there, Michael. So maybe I'll just um, go on and say a little bit more about um, what some people think are some of the interesting uh, implications of this view for um, sort of the ethical status of our tools. Please do, and our... I could go ahead and, and kind of uh, <laughs> nudge you in a particular biased direction. Uh, mm -hmm. I'd be very interested how this might relate with different paradigms of panpsychism. Oh, interesting. Um, well, I, I don't know all the different paradigms in panpsychism. This isn't my my core area. It's something that Isaiah might know more about as a consciousness scholar. Um, but I would think that it's it's really compatible with some forms. So panpsychism is broadly the view, and Michael will know more too, that that um, consciousness exists everywhere in some degree. Um, and I guess one interesting point of distinction here is that the um, so, so something like that prima facie would be quite compatible with the extended mind thesis, which is saying that the mind could, in principle, exist in many different places um, and many different things could have minds. Um, but one, one important distinction here is that at least in their 1998 paper, Clark and Chalmers um, tried to distinguish between non-conscious states and conscious states um, and argue that their view only applies to non-conscious states. So they tried to claim that um, there are certain parts of your mind that can extend, 
but those are only the unconscious parts. Whereas what they claimed is that consciousness requires a high degree of bandwidth in terms of connections between nodes within the mind and that anything that exists outside of the brain, um, essentially anything that's, that requires an action and perception link um, isn't going to maintain the same degree of bandwidth and therefore can't sustain an extended consciousness. Um, so that, so in, in, in essence, what their position was is that consciousness is a purely brain function, um, but that non-conscious states can extend. And so if you think about the information in Otto's notebook, that information was non-conscious, just like the information in Inga's mind was non-conscious until she thought to access it. And then she started to entertain the, the belief that she had that the museum was located on 53rd Street. And then as she's entertaining it, then there becomes something it's like to believe that the museum's on 53rd Street and therefore it's in consciousness. And so you could say something similar about Otto. So Otto's information is being stored externally and that information is, is unconscious, it's part of his unconscious mind. But once it starts um, being actively entertained, then that becomes a brain only state. And so one of the objections um, for those who are thinking of it to the extended mind thesis is to say, well, hey, maybe there is no such thing as the unconscious mind at all then. You know, maybe that's just a bad way to think of the mind. And maybe what we ought to say is just consciousness really is the, the core feature of the mind. And so that way um, we can say that the, the mind really just is brain-based because only consciousness um, is required for the mind. And that, that position has, of course, some drawbacks, which is that um, all of us go to sleep at night and we become unconscious. And so you'd have to say that you don't have a mind when you go to sleep. Um, so, so it, it kind of leads to weird conclusions, right? And, and as well as the fact that many of us and many scholars of the mind and, and many of the sciences of the mind recognize that the non-conscious mind plays a really essential part to much of our conscious life, our decision makings. Um, our memories, our, our sort of access to the world. So you'd, you'd kind of have to bite a bullet and, and cut out um, what many people think today is, is, a, um, is an essential part, a really core part of the mind. So all that, all that non-conscious stuff we have that's doing work for us. So it, so it has a bit of drawbacks there. And um, so one thing I wanted to say is, um, about sort of some of the work that's being done on looking at the ethical and social implications of this view. So what some people have argued is that um, because certain tools are becoming such essential parts of our minds, those tools should have a certain um, elevated status with respect to other artifacts in our lives. So if you consider that um, taking Otto's notebook is like taking a part of his mind. So it's like, it'd be equivalent to kicking him in the head I mean, he would lose a bunch of memories, he would lose a bunch of functionality. And, and so, and likewise, if you took my phone, you know, my cognition is going to drop off dramatically, <laughs> if you take that from me. So, so as a result, some philosophers are thinking, well, it, um, part of the reason, you know, we think that the, the body and the brain in particular, um, deserve a kind of elevated status both kind of morally and, and legally. There are a lot of inst um, democratic constitutions recognize um, a kind of elevated status for bodily protections. Um, some of that seems to be grounded on, on um, looking at things like the integrity of the mind and not be invading somebody's personal privacy and space. And some of those so, um, grounding intuitions seem to apply to our tools and extensions of the mind as well. So if you think about mental privacy, um, and if you consider a smartphone to be really a part of your mind or Otto's notebook to be a part of his mind, then to sort of leafing through his notebook or um, you know, searching through my phone starts to feel a lot more invasive than it used to. And it, it sort of starts to feel more wrong. Um, like, like those tools deserve a, high, a higher degree of protection, perhaps even legally. And so there's some literature on this uh, with respect to the, the case, for example, the, the most high profile one is the case of um, FBI versus Apple um, when they were trying to get into the, the phones of, I believe it was um, from a uh, some of the perpetrators of a mass shooting in San Bernardino County. Um, and this case got uh, al almost all the way up to the Supreme Court and I think only got dropped because the uh, FBI eventually found a way into the phones. And so they, they no longer needed Apple to um, uh, 
unlock them essentially. Um, but that, that was a sort of a big issue of personal privacy. Um, and that, that it, scholars who defend the extended mind a bit like, like myself thought, you know, that, that feels really invasive um, to get into somebody's phone sort of after they're dead. Um, and, and we've seen a lot of that going on, uh, not just in the US, but, but in other places as well of, of police, you know, in one case, um, police tried to use um, the finger of a dead man to unlock his phone. Um, and this is an, an, another perpetrator of a mass shooting in Texas at a Texas church. And so some of these cases um, are sort of are tipping into a bit, bit more invasive and people are starting to look at the phone as being more of an extension of the self. And in fact, in that in that latter case, um, sorry, in, in another case, it went all the way up to the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court and Justice Roberts had written in his, um, uh, in, their, in their court case, basically it was um, a case about CETA, so search incident to arrest. A man was arrested on a routine traffic stop um, and the police uh, took his phone, searched his phone and found that he was guilty of an, a whole totally different crime unrelated to the traffic stop, charged him with that crime. And then um, his lawyers argued that, in fact, the police should never had the right to go through his phone in that case, which was just a, um, a search incident to arrest. CETA is just meant to disarm um, somebody who's been arrested, so to check to, that they have any weapons in their immediate surroundings, and then, of course, to take any evidence to make sure evidence doesn't get destroyed. But in this case, the police took the phone and searched the phone. And what um, Justice John Roberts ended up deciding is that um, essentially it was the equivalent to like taking the keys to somebody's house and then deciding that you had the right to go through their house and search their house because it, it totally overreached or overstepped what CETA was meant to protect. And in what was interesting is that in that write-up, um, Justice Roberts said that uh, if a proverbial visitor from Mars were to come to Earth, they would likely think that smartphones were a part of the human anatomy because of how we all hold them, right? And so he thought, you know, that it's sort of like stepping into somebody's bodily protections there. And it's, it's and, and, and in, in particular, what the judge said is that these phones are the most powerful devices we've ever had in terms of information. And if you think about the quality and quantity of information that, that this tool holds about you as an individual, it's unlike anything we've had before in the history of humanity. I would argue there's more information on my phone than in my brain about me. <laughs> um, Isaiah's maybe not agreeing with that, but certainly my brain misremembers Isaiah and my, my brain portrays things in a certain way, a way that's more favorable to me um, and to helps me get along in life, right? Forgets all the, the silly things I do, whereas my phone remembers everything. Certainly it could tell a more intimate story about me than my best friend could. So it, it tells a lot about you as a person. And um, so anyway, so that's what some philosophers are starting to think about in terms of the status of these devices. Um, I'll, I, I'll try to end there, Michael. <laughs> this is fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Gold.